So I will uh, move forward with a second case, but I'm going to skip through a little bit of it because we have so many excellent questions. Thank you all for submitting these. And I'd really like to spend some time with the panel going through those questions. But just uh, for the sake of completeness, case two is a younger patient. And I think it would be nice to go through um, some thoughts surrounding uh, a younger patient. So it's a 22-year-old woman, and she presents with symptoms for the past eight weeks. Uh, she has uh, right-sided abdominal pain, increased bowel movement frequency, and weight loss. Laboratory assessment is consistent with potential uh, inflammation. And a colonoscopy and subsequent CT enterography demonstrate long-segment active inflammation in the terminal ileum. She actually did not have uh, stenosis. It was all active inflammatory disease. So at this point, as you're thinking about treatment recommendations for her, just as Susie asked, um, there are a number of things that we'd like to know. Uh, what her employment is, family and social history, vaccination history, and personal preference on medications. I try to uh, discuss this with patients just so we want to optimize their adherence up front if we can, um, based on um, their profession, um, what they do, uh, if they're going to need to travel, you know, various aspects of their care. And certainly one of the things I've learned is you don't have to live in California, Gil, to have um, the granola aspects. I have met many young people who were not vaccinated as kids, um, and they come to, to college without vaccinations, and it uh, can be uh, quite a difficult thing when they get newly diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So she works as a retail clerk. Um, she volunteers. She does work in a local homeless shelter. Um, Gary talked to us a little bit about uh, risk factors uh, with some of the medications we use. Um, she grew up in a large family, and she did not uh, get vaccinations. But she's not against vaccines. She just was never offered them. And she is amenable to vaccination now if you recommend it. She does not regularly see a doctor, um, as with many of these young patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, and she wants the therapy that has the best side effect profile. That's her primary consideration, although she also wants it to be effective. And she's OK with any modality uh, of therapy. And so really, I think at this point in her case, you're at a, a point where you need to consider kind of two options. Do you bridge her with a therapy that would be amenable to offering live vaccinations now? and then subsequently um, start her on therapy? Or do you omit the live vaccines and go ahead and proceed with systemic combination therapy for Crohn's disease and inactivated vaccines? I think there are arguments for both approaches, and you'll have to involve the patient in terms of uh, this decision making. If we did want to think about um, bridging her, how long we would need, when you think about uh, live vaccines, as the panel has mentioned, you need to have at least four weeks after that um, prior to starting the immunosuppression, particularly for varicella vaccine and MMR vaccine, which are much more potent live vaccines than the uh, live zoster vaccine that we have available for older populations. And one thing to keep in mind is that you can do a two-dose schedule for varicella vaccine separated by four weeks. Um, and this is recommended if there is sufficient time prior to start of an immunosuppressive therapy. And so uh, with my pediatric colleagues, sometimes what we will actually do is uh, in these younger patients, sometimes you can bridge them on enteral nutrition therapy while you actually give them um, vaccines. And they, they will do that if the scenario is such that you feel you can wait. Administration of varicella vaccine can be considered in patients who are with IBD who are receiving long-term or low-dose immunosuppression. This is a newer recommendation per IDSA. Um, again, the, the real um, issue here is you want to avoid um, active um, varicella and activation of that vaccine. Um, MMR should not be considered with any level of immunosuppression, um, only, prior, uh, only prior to. And you can give one or two doses of this vaccine at least four weeks apart, depending on the indication. And so you really do need to have some time if you're going to give her live vaccines in order uh, to delay and wait and start uh, uh, significant immunosuppression. There, there are very little data um, about are some of our medications better than others in terms of giving live vaccines. At this point, there's been a case report published on um, vetalizumab. Um, no, no data exists um, other than, uh, than this, really. The FDA label actually indicates that patients should receive live vaccines on um, vetalizumab only if the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, certainly, um, in, this was a University of Chicago patient. There was a case report kind of when that measles outbreak happened that they wanted to uh, 
um, a booster vaccinate one of their patients, and they described her scenario with receiving this vaccine on vetalizumab. When we get to the panel, I, I will ask uh, if others have any experience with this, but at this point, again, uh, it's not um, recommended. Um, how do you counsel her? You really want to talk to her about the infectious risks of IBD therapies, particularly given the fact that she's really emphasized uh, a therapy with the best side effect profile as her desire. And so uh, tuberculosis is something you want to consider. She volunteers in a homeless shelter, and those are people that are at increased risk. Uh, and as Gary mentioned to us, the key aspect here is that uh, there's reactivation associated with anti-TNF therapy, and so we really do need to screen. The reason why this is so important, if we actually treat that latent TB prior to initiation of anti-TNF therapy, this decreases the incidence of active TB by over 80%. And in our uh, question discussion, we'll talk about some strategies to do that. And so I'm going to go ahead and skip through um, the infectious risks of herpes zoster and pneumonia in the interest of time. Um, we've, we've talked about that. But this was a very nice um, paper that came out recently that did a nice summary on infections and IBD therapy. And one of the things I like about this figure is that uh, it, it's very self-explanatory. You know, with patients, I often use a lot of absolute numbers. These stick figures can be helpful in that you can see, oh, these are numbers of people, and you can see the differences. These cartoons can kind of speak a thousand words, so to speak. And so these are actually the incidence rates per 10,000 person years um, for serious infection and opportunistic infections for uh, thiopurine monotherapy, anti-TNF monotherapy, and combination therapy. And so this is something to take into consideration um, to, to share these data such that for those that are potentially preventable, uh, we want to try to vaccinate. Um, immunization guidelines in IBD certainly have been re reviewed. These are the live vaccines that are most often given in the U.S., uh, and we really should um, be aware of those contraindications in immunosuppression. And, and that the key take-home point is that if you're on an immunomodulator at the doses we use, that's not considered uh, enough immunosuppression that the former live um, zoster vaccine would be contraindicated. Frankly, though, now, um, based on the new Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices guidelines, there's not going to be much role for that live um, zoster vaccine. The new uh, inactivated zoster vaccine is much more potent. It seems to have better durability. And so it's actually recommended that even individuals who received the prior uh, zoster live vaccine actually get this inactivated vaccine. So I don't think we're going to be using uh, the former vaccine to set with much uh, frequency um, moving forward. So how would you counsel her? She's really interested in risks, and so I want to discuss some of the potential malignant risks of IBD therapy. Um, we talked about cervical dysplasia already. I'm going to move through that so that we can, um, can move to lymphoma. And so I think that really this is a big big interest for our patients, and many of them have gone online, and on the internet they'll see they have double the risk of lymphoma and don't want to start one of these therapies. And so this is very important in terms of shared decision making and really educating your patient as to what these risks truly are in terms of absolute numbers. So this was a nice study um, in, the, in the French National Health Insurance Database that just came out in JAMA last year. And what what I think is so important about this study is that for years uh, we weren't certain what the risk was of lymphoma with anti-TNF agents alone. We felt that that population was so, um, uh, there, there was so much prior thiopurine use in that population that it was very difficult to get a, a clear assessment of what the risk was with anti-TNF. And what is great about this particular database is they really do have all of the data in terms of prior medication use uh, for each of these individuals. So it's really one of the first times we're able to get at the information of, is there a risk of TNF alone? Uh, these were patients that had not previously been exposed to thiopurines. And these are the risks, the incidence rates per 1,000 patient years for lymphoma. And as you can see, um, unexposed it was 0.26, thiopurines 0.54. Anti-TNF alone, 0.41, and combination therapy, 0.95. And so I'll show you the table from this paper. Now, interestingly, this table is very similar uh, to data that Corey Siegel and others had published uh, modeling this out many years ago. But what you can see here is that the risk with anti-TNF alone is still a two-fold increased hazard ratio. With combination therapy, it's a six-fold increase. But we have more certainty around this estimate because this TNF population was not previously exposed to thiopurines. 
And so the way I talk to patients about this is I really talk about absolute risk. The risk in the general population is two per 10,000 patients over the course of a year. The risk on any one of these therapies, a thiopurine or an anti-TNF, is four. And the risk on combination is six. But overall, that number is quite low. And you, when you compare it to the risk of if someone's had an ileal cecal resection requiring surgery over the next five years, which is 50%, 5,000 out of those 10,000 patients, you can really help the patient to see the risk benefit. The other important thing um, to note um, in regards to thiopurines and lymphoma, this was a meta-analysis that showed us a, a similar increased risk that we do want to think about the fact that younger patients um, seem to have the highest relative risk, but the absolute risk was highest in older, um, uh, in older populations. So the populations where you may want to consider limiting thiopurine exposure are the young uh, and the old. And I'd be remiss not to include at least one side on hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma in that while incredibly rare, this is a, a, a fatal, a rapidly fatal lymphoproliferation that can be very aggressive in young uh, men, particularly young men under the age of 35 on combination therapy uh, and, and particularly involving a thiopurine. And so the estimated risk, absolute risk on thiopurines is one out of 45,000. In men less than 35, here are the numbers. I think that the key aspect is that if you're not under the age of 35, you have a, a very low risk. Um, in fact, 99.9% .9 of patients will not develop hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma with the exception of men younger than age 35. And finally, I just wanted to touch on with thiopurines, when you're discussing risks with your patients, we do also have some newer data that are looking at urinary tract malignancies with thiopurines. And this was a French cohort study that demonstrated an increased risk um, in individuals currently on thiopurines. But actually, once the thiopurine was stopped, this risk did not persist. So it's similar to lymphoma in that while you're on the drug, this risk seems to go up. But once you stop it, it goes all the way back down to baseline, which is unlike the risk that, uh, that my colleagues have described with non-melanoma skin cancer, where actually that risk still persists after discontinuation. And the reason we think that's the case is that there's actually been phototoxic damage that has occurred at the DNA level associated with the photosensitivity uh, with azathioprine, and so that's not reversible. And so, uh, again, wearing that sunscreen now, that primary prevention can help with that. With urinary tract malignancies and lymphoma, the key is once that thiopurine is stopped, that risk goes back to baseline. And so this was also just a nice summary slide that I wanted to review before we move into the next section on malignancy and IBD, where as you can see, for lymphoma, there seems to be an increased risk, particularly uh, thiopurines, although certainly they are with anti-TNF now. For non-melanoma skin cancer, thiopurines, uh, perhaps a signal with anti-TNF. Melanoma, it really seems to be driven by the TNF. Urinary tract cancer, thiopurines. Colorectal cancer, actually, as, as Susie mentioned, you know, these medications that treat that ongoing inflammation, that histologic inflammatory activity is what we think drives this. And so particularly for thiopurines uh, and, and starting to see even with anti-TNFs, we have data that this reduces the risk of colorectal cancer in these individuals. Importantly, there have been studies in breast cancer. There does not seem to be any increased risk, risk of solid organ tumors like breast cancer. And so overall, in terms of thinking about the risk of cancer, again, um, based on this chart, you see somewhat higher associated with thiopurines, and that may affect our prescribing patterns and our treatment strategies for our patients. And that I know there's some questions about that, so we will get to that with the panel. So just in summary for this case, before we move on, um, I would recommend prevention of infections. So immunizations as appropriate, pneumococcal, influenza are inactivated. So we could discuss bridging therapies to allow for live vaccination or forego it. She was so terribly symptomatic that we really didn't feel that we had the ability to wait. She didn't respond initially to Entecourt, and so we forego, we forwent, I guess, um, the live vaccines and did the inactivated vaccines and started her on therapy. Importantly, we did do TB and hepatitis B testing prior to biologic. And in my practice, I don't necessarily check an annual PPD or an annual IGRA. I do more of a risk-based approach where if someone travels internationally to endemic areas, or as in this case, she volunteers in a homeless shelter, she's certainly someone who I would repeatedly um, check uh, from, from an um, exposure to a tuberculosis standpoint. I did offer her HPV vaccine, again, an inactivated vaccine, um, pap smears at recommended intervals, and we discussed the importance of um, skin cancer uh, prevention, uh, both through um, sunscreen use and regular screen screening.